Hey everybody, CVH here, back with another Budget of Five video, and today we're going to be looking at Token Mage. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Budget of Five series, you've never seen one on the channel before, what we're doing is taking established lists and decks that you would probably see on the ladder at high ranks, and budgetifying or making them easier to craft for new players and those of you just starting out in Legends, building your collection, and we're doing that by removing all of the Legendary and Epic cards in them, as well as all the monthly reward cards, and the cards from the Madhouse Collection and Fall of the Dark Brotherhood because you need to buy those car uh, buy those expansions with gold or money before you get the cards in them. And we are replacing them and making the deck entirely built with commons and rares from the core set and now Heroes of Skyrim, which recently came out, giving us a lot of new budget tools because those are cards you can pull from packs and without buying any of the set with money or gold, you can still soul summon them with soul gems. So it should make these decks a lot more easy to play uh, if you're just starting out and you want to get your feet wet in the ladder. So today we're looking at, like I said, Token Mage. And the version you can see in front of you is Turquoise Link's most recent version at the time I'm doing this video on Legend legends-dex.com. Now, he finished number one legend with this uh, in the month of July. Uh, I finished a measly number 10 at legend. He finished number one. So obviously this deck is very, very powerful. Uh, it was either this exact version or just a couple cards different, but to finish number one really shows the deck's power. So I'll briefly go over it a bit. Uh, and I'm choosing to do this token mage over action mage. I got a lot of requests to redo the action mage budgetify. Yeah, it's a long time ago I did that one. And I chose to do token mage over it because this is sort of the direction that the very aggressive mage decks are taking nowadays. With some of that emphasis on the token generating cards uh, instead of just actions with Lilindril Hex Mage and Crystal Tower Crafter. Which saw a pretty serious nerf a long time ago. Uh, but if you're curious what I mean by tokens, if you've never heard that term before, I'm talking basically about cards that generate other cards, like Imperial Reinforcements, if you were playing Magic the Gathering or some other uh, real-life card game, for example, it would say put 411 Imperial Grunt tokens on the board. So that's a token generator, Scouting Patrol's a token generator, Marked Men's a token generator, uh, and the cards that benefit them include Divine Fervor, which buffs your entire board, so really powers your, uh, really benefits you if you're going wide on the board and filling up both lanes quickly. Uh, imprisoned to take advantage of all your yellow tokens, which is basically where this deck is, as you can see. Currently, 40 of the cards are willpower. Uh, Fifth Legion, Trainer, Resolute Ally, you get the idea, right? So let's start replacing some cards. Uh, all the Epics, Legendaries, Fall of the Dark Brotherhood cards, and Madhouse cards, and monthly reward cards, if there were any, need to go. Unfortunately, the first card we need to get rid of is Marked Man. A really versatile card. That 0-2 makeshift defenses is not willpower, it's a neutral card. Without any attack value of itself, but like I mentioned, this deck is full of ways to buff your little guys, including things that start with zero attack. And this card really helps your consistency in getting pit line on the board. Uh, but fortunately, and unfortunately, we also have to get rid of the pit lines because they're epics, but let's start with a replacement for the Marked Man. Uh, so we're looking for, ideally, another 1-drop that sort of fits the role. Uh, Marked Man, obviously one of the better things to start the game with. And luckily for us, Heroes of Skyrim, the recent expansion, came out and gave us a Solitude Stalwart, which I've even seen in token decks alongside Marked Man. Obviously, you lose some of the versatility with the makeshift defenses coming out and enabling cards like Pit Lion or just getting extra value out of 5th Legion trainers and stuff like that, but Solitude Stalwart is a really reasonable 1-drop by itself and can push a bit more damage early, so it does have some upsides. The next cards we'll be getting rid of are the Pit Lions and the 3 Daggerfall Mages, so one of the cards that's pushing us into Intelligence Blue in this deck is going... And that's going to be pretty difficult to replace. But first, let's get a good replacement for the Pit Lion. Uh, I say this a lot, but uh, basically Pit Lion is one of your powerhouse cards in decks that run it. It's one of the cards that you jam it down, and it can just sort of steamroll and win the game by itself due to its immense stats. And a replacement I frequently use for cards like that is Mortal Executioner. It's another 3-drop, it's another willpower card, it clearly benefits aggressive decks because you're getting that added attack power when you're destroying your opponent's runes, uh, and it's another card that if left alone, it can just win you the game. Unfortunately, it's very easy to deal with the turn you play it unless you're getting an immediate buff, but that's pretty frequent in this deck because you're getting pretty aggressive very early. Uh, so while it is a little bit easier to get rid of immediately, the ceiling on this card is way higher than Pit Lion because it can get up to like 8 or 10 attack fairly consistently. And for the Daggerfall Mage spot, we're going to actually be using yet another card from Heroes of Skyrim. There's nothing that really does what Daggerfall Mage does. Uh, it's just incredibly 
value-oriented card that also trades very well, but we'll just use the spot for three Call of Valors. Now, Call of Valor, we don't really have any support cards that benefit our shouts. We're not using Greybeard Mentor or Wordwolf to give these Call of Valors added consistency because these will be the three only the only three shouts in the deck. Uh, however, it's a reasonable body on turn three. Three cost, three, three is fine. And if the game happens to go late or you happen to be able to draw extra cards and find that second or third Call of Valor, it's another card that could potentially cheese out a win very easily. Next up, we have the three Cloudrest Illusionists, amazing prophecy card, uh, and able to you know reduce the damage that's incoming to you while giving you a pretty reasonable body that can help you trade, and also really powerful from your hand. Your opponent might try to block with a Hive Defender or Thorn Hist Mage, some guard that's in your way, and Cloudrest Illusionists can allow your guys with low health to trade even effectively against those cards. So unfortunately, we have to get rid of this card, uh, and what I'm going to use in the spot, uh, I would like to mention there are a few different options here. Um, I haven't tested a lot of these, obviously, this is a budget deck, and so I haven't played a lot of the different variants you could go by taking out the Cloud Rest Illusionists. I was thinking about Aradon Paladin, uh, can give you a bit of drain in this deck, as you can see we do have a fair bit of actions. Uh, if you're looking to replace it with just another Prophecy, we did get another fantastic budget card in Heroes of Skyrim, Mystic Dragon. Just a 4-drop 4-4 four, four Prophecy, not really in the color we want, but it can cheese out games, you know, early Mystic Dragon's really, really hard to beat if you get it for free out of the first or second rune especially. But since we are an aggressive deck, and uh, I, my reasoning here basically is that Cloud Rest Illusionist is really good at helping you trade into guards. So I'll be adding three copies of Royal Sage. Even though we don't have a lot of really good statted cards to play before then, we will probably be ahead in life, and we can roll lethal on those little tokens. We'll have a lot of different ways, or a lot of different creatures on the board to get keywords off the Sage, and even though things like Drain and Regenerate and Breakthrough aren't great on things with 1-3 to three attack, uh, getting Lethal or Ward can be really, really obnoxious for your opponents to deal with, and that's sort of the same kind of obnoxiousness that Cloud Rest Illusionist brings to the table, so I'll just be including three Royal Sages as another fine aggressive tool in place of the Cloud Rest here. And there's a ton of cards we need to cut to end the deck. Uh, usually with these decks, the, the mid to high cost cards are going to be the most expensive, and in this deck we curve out a, a 5 cost, so not a whole lot of late game to replace, but still a few cards. We have the Legate, the unique legendary, Iron, and Barbus. Now all of those cards are fairly unique, so I'm not even going to really try to duplicate their effects. I will say that if you have the Fall of the Dark Brotherhood expansion, a common replacement for the Legate is the Black Dragon, and I've actually seen this card played in conjunction with the Legate and, in the, and instead of the Legate in a few different decks. This card just has really good stats. But since it is from the Fall of the Dark Brotherhood, and while I strongly recommend, as always, that you guys get that expansion, that story mode, and get those cards that are in it, um, I understand that a lot of you might not have it, and we need to do some better budget replacements. But before we get into some of those, we also have to cut the three copies of Divine Fervor. Now, I really, really don't think that, uh, so I should mention that you get one copy of Divine Fervor uh, as an upgrade from Divine Conviction, I think, at level 9. So as long as you're leveling up your account, you will own a copy of Divine Fervor. I don't recommend that you play this deck at least before level 9. You should at least have one copy of Divine Fervor. And if you're looking for my personal recommendation on the first epic craft if you're looking to play this deck at a more serious level, it would be the second and third copies of Divine Fervor. This card is just the pinnacle of a token deck, uh, what it wants to do. It used to cost four, and as you can imagine it was pretty absurd when it did cost four, although a lot of other cards were also pre-nerf as well, but Divine Fervor even at five is one of the most important cards in this deck, so I definitely recommend that you wait and you play this deck when you level up to nine. That being said, I was really close to playing this one copy in this budgetified deck, but for the sake of this video, I am going to show you that even without this one copy of Divine Fervor, hopefully this deck can win some games at casual. But yeah, definitely play the one copy of Divine Fervor you're given at level 9, uh, and definitely uh, consider crafting those second and third copies. Also, if you have the Fall of the Dark Brotherhood again, uh, Corsair Ship, to me, seems like a fairly reasonable replacement for the Divine Fervor second and third copies. If you have that expansion, uh, this card is going to give you a Corsair immediately, and and while it's not going to be buffing the attack and health of everything, nor will it be buffing the things you already have on board when you play the Corsair ship, uh, this card can, over a course of a few turns, add a substantial amount of damage to your board. So I definitely think this card is something you could use to replace the Fervors, but again, Fervor being incredibly important, you should look to get them fairly soon if you're looking to play this deck seriously. However, we have another really powerful card that can close out some games that I've used in several of the budgetified decks so far, and that is Golden Saint. Similar to Royal Sage, we will be ahead on life more often than not, hopefully. 
And uh, also, it just adds a substantial amount of stats to the board, somewhat like a Divine Fervor, you know, 8-8 eight, eight for 6 is really, really powerful, and it can protect some of your little guys. It can uh, serve to get in the way of your opponent attacking Morthal Executioner or something, for example. So yeah, just a fine card that we can use to close out the game, uh, one of the better rares in Willpower, to be sure. Now we have a bit of space left, and what I want to do is add a third copy of Priest of the Eight. I think this card is really good, really good card draw, allowing us to keep our pressure up. Um, definitely probably just a space inclusion here that he was only playing two of them. Uh, but Priest of the Eight is totally reasonable in my opinion, and we're probably going to have two willpower cards on the board a lot of the time. And we have two slots left. Obviously, if we could play Divine Fervors in this slot, we would. But what I'm actually going to do here... Uh, instead of even playing the one copy of Divine Fervor and something else, I'm just going to include two copies of Piercing Javelin. Uh, Piercing Javelin, not in this deck just because it's kind of slow. I mean, it's obviously a fine card. It doesn't really make any deck too much worse, right? But we have Imprison as our main removal right here. And then as soon as we start dealing a lot of damage, we can just focus on hitting them in the face with cards like Lightning Bolt. So not really a whole lot of things that only Javelin can deal with in games that we're going to win anyway. If the game goes too late, Javelin gets better, but our deck probably stops winning at a certain point. However, Javelin is a fine little replacement card. Uh, definitely solid removal, if I've ever seen some, a fine prophecy as well. So we can just fill whatever extra space we have left with the Piercing Javelins. If you find yourself not having a third copy of some other card that I included, sure, just fill the space with the Piercing Javelin. It should be fine. Again, Definitely include that one copy of Divine Fervor, even like one Javelin, one Divine Fervor, or go down to the two Priest of the Eights and get that one Divine Fervor for level 9 upgrades in there. It's a really important card, and will lead to a lot of wins, especially if you can get the second and third copies. But this is our budgetified deck for the video. Uh, let's take it to casual, try to win some games. It looks good to me, and if you enjoy the video, the deck replacements, and the games, feel free to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more Legends content every day, budgetified videos, other gameplay videos, strategy videos, all kinds of things. Follow my stream in the description and I'll see you guys next time. Here are some Budgetify token mage games and casual. Alright, let's do this thing. Got a fellow mage to start things off, and we have a 1 and a 2, so let's keep those, and I don't think we would ever keep Piercing Javelin in our opener. Hail, friend. So now it looks like we just need to figure out turn 3. May you walk on the warm and like I mentioned, this deck is fairly aggressive, so we're going to be getting on the board early, we're going to be trying to smack face, and that's even more important now due to the uh, the Royal Sages and the, the Golden Saints that are in this deck. Turn 3 has effectively been figured out. My orders are clear. Let's Wardcraft over here and try to get a favorable on this Lurking Crocodile. Lurking Crocodile, another fine budget card. And also, just a fine card in general, you see it in aggro battle mage lists that are not budget at all. And yes, I fully realize the irony of me doing these budget decks while also having a full premium budget deck. So we could double attack after playing the Morthal Executioner. That is the aggressive line. We could also Scouting Patrol and Priest of the Eight to get some card draw going. I'm kind of liking the Scouting Patrol Priest of the Eight line, so I think I'm going to go with it. Let's get the card draw going first. I'm going to play this in the right. Try to clear up some of this stuff. And I think I'll trade wards here and get him down to 26. Which is a nice happy life total for him to be at because it sets up really well to maybe get double proc on our Morthal Executioner. Bringing it up to 6 attack immediately. And he's just going right for the face, I respect that. I have Defender, I wish he hadn't played that. Imprison off the top? Oh, Resolute Ally off the top, now that could be good enough. We're kind of forced into doing it though. And it really needs to hit. All right, it did. That is fortunate. I think I will attack here. You start dealing some damage in case we draw the Golden Saints. Need to uh, activate the East March Crusader, even though I probably won't play it next turn. We'll see what happens, though. Now that's a bit of misordering, uh, unless he decides to use that Firebolt as well, because now I know he has a Firebolt in hand, whereas if he played that first, got the Firebolt and used the one he got, I would uh, I would not know what that other card in his hand would be, even though it would be a Firebolt, I wouldn't have the, any way to know that. So that is something to consider, that he did not consider. But good for us, extra information is always welcome. Two bad plays fighting for which one is worse. I think I'm still going to go with the East March because odds are really high of us getting a, a playable card off the top. Let's do that. 
We do. Nice. Training is over. It's time to act. Putting the 4-2 in the right, because if he firebolts one of these two, the other one can trade with the 3-3 three, three next turn. And we knew he had the firebolt. Again, that's important knowledge to have. I've got you covered. Careful there, friend. Well, I do get my trade with the ally. Can't complain about that. You can't defeat us. Do I want the two of them in the left or the two of them in the right? I, think I want only one of them in the right. Lead me into battle. And we can use this one one to take off the ward here. So he doesn't use a 3-3 for that. He'll get a free attack on my 5th Legion Trainer, but it already got a lot of value. And it's kind of nice that we're a little bit forcing him into attacking the dudes. I would think. Maybe he just goes face to heal a bit more. But I'm kind of okay with that, too. Now, Dawnstar Healer is another wonderful card for this deck if you're worried about other aggro decks. But it's an epic, of course, so we didn't play it in this budget version. And we finally win back the board. We go for Priest of the Eight first, I think. The Eight us. We could go Morthal, Scouting Patrol, Imprison that, ignore that, hit face for a good bit. I'm liking that, that's very aggressive. And it's all thanks to that imprison draw, so drawing first paying off there. Doesn't prevent prophecies. And it's okay to wait on the imprison because scouting patrol can always activate it. And the 2 1 over here still doesn't have a good trade, and we, uh, Made the call that that 2 damage to face wasn't going to be too important here. A hard fought victory. It has been an engaging My fight is done. Fair enough, sometimes you can't take back the board. And we got a Call of Valor forward, nice. A Sorcerer, and we do have the ring this time. So we can go ahead and ring out one of our two drops, play another one. I think I'll ship East March now, not sure exactly how aggressive we'll be getting. Call of Valor is probably a safer on curve three drop. Sorcerer also has a lot of ways to deal with things with 2 health between Firebolt and Sorcerer's Negation now. Yeah, let's go ahead and play this Bruma first. May you walk on warm sands. There's a plan. There's always a plan. A Sorcerer does not traditionally have good ways to deal with a lot of things. A lot of them don't play Ice Storm or Firestorm, of course. So, uh, pure reinforcements, a really good card in the matchup. I will be protecting that with the Ward Crafter. If I play the Ward Crafter left, he can trade with the Harpy. I don't think that's the worst, though, because then I can guarantee I get a full Imperial Reinforcements next turn on the right. And this is really the important thing to protect anyway. I could have Sorcerer's Negation. I'm just gonna hope he doesn't. With the Scouting Patrol draw, the Ward Crafter uh, number two to protect the Bruma further doesn't seem bad. Still putting four attack on the board, and we know he has that Fiery Bolt, so we should maybe use that knowledge to make a better play here. Again, gonna fill up the left, I think. Take over the field lane. 
If you guys are wondering about lane placement, like the very basics, there's a really good article on my website, Between the Lanes by Tens, the, uh, the essentials of lane positioning. It's not called the essentials, though. But it's uh, Tens' guide to lane positioning. And it does go over the essentials, what you should know about why taking over the field lane is important so we can dictate the trades and all that good stuff. And of course, taking into consideration cards like Imperial Reinforcements in this deck. Of course, this is kind of unlikely to just die right now. But it's better than having two things in each lane. So we can get at least three reinforcements if we want to play it next turn. But at that point, I might just play Call of Valor. Call of Valor in prison. Not bad. Lead me into battle. Acknowledge. You will foil my plan. And in that case, we didn't attack the phase first because if you got like a even a lightning bolt or something that would deal with one of these one ones, all of a sudden I wouldn't have enough yellow guys to play the Imprison unless I played the Imperial Reinforcements instead. And I just wanted to make this play. It's a good card, but it is slow here. I keep a spare blade in my boot. Could defend a bit with the Hive Defender. Well, I like this trade. Yeah, let's go face and see what happens. Good, nothing. So if we play the Hive Defender in the left, it'll force him to use the Firebolt on it. He has the Steel Dagger, but that doesn't really impact the trades. Should protect my 3-3, which is one of the highest attack things on board right now. So sure, let's do it. Get a 3-6 on board instead of 3-3 worth of Imperial Grunts. Definitely not against playing Imperial Reinforcements, I just like to hold off until it's full value or in case we have nothing better to do. And I think the Hive Defender is slightly better here. Careful there, friend. Good as Golden Saint is, it'd be a lot better if he didn't have that 4-1 with Ward right there. Can't do a whole lot about that. The question is whether or not I trade with this 2-1 here. If I don't, I can put him at 11. That doesn't seem bad. If I do that, he has the trade with the Golden Saint, of course. Um, he already used the Firebolt, we know he has, so maybe this is safe at that point. He would just take the trade he would already take. So yeah, let's let's give the trade a shot. I could potentially see you going face being fine as well. I mean, we're going face a bit, but going face a bit more. And while that one dies free, it could protect something else, so it's still not without value. And then we just get a 4-4 in this lane, of course. And we are at 38, by the way. This Bruma has just sort of lived the entire game so far. I hate this crown. Oh, uh, jeez. That's really good. So I still have a bit of damage on board. Oh, he's doing it like that, huh? Interesting. I figured he would use the, uh... Well, I guess he would play it in the other lane then, and use it on this one, and then trade and trade, because he doesn't really kill anything extra now. Because that ward of my own is getting in the way. A giant 8-8 with ward. Seems good. East March is strong here. Now, if I were playing Divine Fervors, I would definitely want to do it first, so I could maybe draw Divine Fervor, ring into it, and get some extra damage going. Um, but I still think I'd do it first. I'll play it over here, because it's looking like my left lane might be the reinforcements lane this turn. If I have nothing better to draw. Alright, looks like we are playing enforcements. Like, reinforcements. I am not going to trade just to get an extra 1-1. I think I want the face damage more. And we have 8 of it. Should we get the max damage in? No prophecies, that's good. Your orders, your orders, your orders. The fighting for the board is getting just a bit tougher, but his life is just getting lower. And that's exactly how we want it to go. 
And this deck even has lightning bolts. So uh, as long as we get him within a reasonable amount of life, if he can't kill us quick enough in response, then we'll just eventually draw some damage, hopefully. My friend would like a and Sorcerer, again, is pretty bad at healing, so we're not too worried about it. He can't even answer the board, as it turns out. GG. As we don't hit some crazy prophecy, we should be good. Don't make me laugh. Runs. Get in there. We even have the jab and other reinforcements. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, you'll notice from your hand a lot of the time when you're already ahead on, or like, close to winning, or even in contention for winning, using Javelin can seem like an overcost of imprison in this deck, so it's not really needed, but it's okay. It's okay. But that's some of the deck. Hopefully you all enjoyed. I'll see you guys next time.